So thank you so much for being here. It means a lot because you know there's a bigger room with nicer chairs and there's a water and everything, but you choose to be here. So thank you. And I, I will make it worth your time because this is, although the, the title kind of silly, but you will kind of understand why I named the title that way. So I'm, I'm Tuya, I'm actually a data science uh, person, uh, but I'm now working as a DRE, developer relation engineer for Google. And over there, I kind of make things easier and fun for people to build things and learn things. So yeah, and if you want to talk about other things that I enjoy doing, like whether the pyramid was built by the aliens or is there any other world outside of ours, yeah, feel free to hit me up. Okay, so before I get started, I will just show you something. So I promise, uh, you know, this is going to be exciting. You're going to build this whole pipeline from end to end, right? It's quite, yeah, quite, quite nice. But the whole, actually, I, it's a subset of what I just built. Like I built something similar to this, but with like three branches. Like you can see there's like a lot of things going on, but this is like simplified version. So you'll be building data pipeline like this after another talk. So let's go. Right, so <clears throat> this is actually built by me two years ago. And I, I'm still surprised not a lot of people have like figured out on how to work with streaming data properly until now. Like at that time, I was really new to the team and then they just throw me to this project it's called Frog Finder. And it's a real time uh, detecting frog, right? Like so imagine you purchase something and then the banks keep track of your transitions, right? And hopefully, no one's copy your credit cards and buy something, right? So that, that's like our ask from the bank, right? Please keep our money safe, right? If not, everyone just take your money and you don't have anything left. But what if, right, someone buys something using your credit card, then you get to know it three, three months later. It's not very nice, right? You, you, you want to know it right now, right? If something happening, let me, like, tell me now. So this is where the requirement is. It has to be real time. Right? It can't be like two days from now, or one day from now, one week from now. It has to be now, right? So whenever you tap your card, like it or not, it's going to happen, like trigger an event, right? The events actually say some of the transitional information, like transition ID, timestamps, customer ID, the terminal ID, amount, sometimes they save a location, you know, your profile, IDs, and so on, right? So this is what you would normally get from a tap. For you, just a tap, but then at the back end, there's a lot of transition going on. All right, so our goal is to use those data, right? So whenever you generate your tap, right, and we want to make it in a way that the machine learning can tell us whether there is something that's done by the user or a fraud, right? So someone do it on, on your behalf, basically. Okay, let me just do, I think this is better because, uh, so in typical machine learning workflow, you have this, right? So don't talk about LMN and other things. It's like very fancy topics and all, but in the traditional machine learning, you have this workflow. You collect your data and then you do feature engineering where you try to create signal from your data and then you do model building, right? So if you're a data scientist, data analyst, you will be doing that front part a little bit more and then there's a model subbing part where if you're a machine learning engineer, you do that, okay? So, but for this particular talk, we will just be talking this feature engineering, right? So this is where we need the signal right now to be able to detect whether that's fraud or not. So in the past, our data are small or were small. Used to be able to fit in like a low GB, you know, your laptop or server that has like a monolith kind of architecture. But nowadays, the data are big like really, really big, right? So every, every day your transitional data could be like a terabyte to pentabyte. Depends on how big your company is or how big your traffic is. And being able to kind of like process this amount of data require you to do a lot more, you know, not just like for loop kind of thing. You have to do parallel processing. You have to think about, right, like missing data because there's a lot more uh, chance for the data to go wrong than having a small data. And sometimes the data are not stationary, right? It's not just gonna be just sit there and then one day you just go there, it's there. It's streaming sometimes, right? You can see from the, the left, it's like 8 a.m. all the way to 21, that's like 9 p.m. It's, it's streaming somehow, right? From the left to the top and like top to the bottoms. And if, if you ask, let's say like at 6 p.m., I want to know what's my you know, average 
customer spend within last 15 minutes. You have to then like go to the data, seek, right? Like you have to go and seek a data and then chunk off a part and then you have to do it, right? You have to do some computation, finding sums or average or something, right? So, but what if your data is arrived late? Like for example, you are supposed to arrive at eight, but some of the data arrived at 8.45, someone actually like really, really late, like arrived at 8 p.m. instead of 8 a.m. So how are you going to like correct these kind of informations, right? Like if you're gonna do average, let's say up to 10, should you include this late one or not? So these are the things that you have to think when you do streaming data, right? Like stale data, you can just write a SQL statement. Like let's start from this table, right? Filter this and then you have the summation. But for the streaming, you have to start thinking of this. If the data is late, do I discard it? And then if I discard it, then how, what's my window of discarding it? Right, should I take the second one or should I take the last one? But of course, if you take the last one, you cannot compute the average or whatever trans transmutation until you reach to 21, right? Because this is where the data come in. Right? But how you know the data is come, gonna come in at uh, 8.30? You never know, right? It might never come, right? It might never come, just, just, disappear, right? It could be that the store set on fires or the internet cut down, or something happened. We never know. So you have to come up with some set of rules, like industry practice, to be able to say, like, if I don't receive the data by one hour, I'm gonna just forget about it. I will take it as the new data, right? Like, would it work? It very depends on industry, how fast your transition is supposed to be, and also depends on your business use case, right? Like, do, do I have any impact for not including the latecomers? So you have to stretch your minds and start thinking about these kind of uh, problems that come with streaming data, right? And I'm just gonna cover just one. There's like 20 of those. And like, you, you don't even know how much of the data is trying to come into your system at one point in time, right? Like, let's say if you're an e-commerce owner and then you have a promotion like 11, 11 or 12, 12, you cannot expect that the, the traffic should be huge, but you never know how big the traffic is gonna be, right? So this is where, if you're an architect or if you're trying to build a systems like this, you have to think of that in, in your mind to, to build something that resilience to that, right? My requirements were like quite simple. Of course, there's a lot more. I just like tried to take three out, right? So they, they told me I need to do, for each transition, calculate uh, the number of transitions that happen for, for a user within 15 minutes, 30, and 60, right? Three time frame. And I have to find out the amount of transacted, like how much they are spending, and then uh, the average of the transaction amount. So think of it this way, right? Like if you go, if so every day you buy something, let's say you buy a coffee in the morning, right? You only buy one coffee, right? Maybe you buy for your colleagues, maybe four. But you won't buy 100 coffee, right? I, I don't know, you might, uh, but, uh, but most of the time, Ask me for password. No, no password, please. Uh, yeah, so by looking at the pattern of your purchase in the past, right, we can kind of tell whether you are the ones that are making the, the purchase or not. Because this is your behavior, right? If you, if you buy one coffee every day, and then suddenly we see 20 coffee for that time, that most likely, it could be you, just that highly likely not. So you have to think from like that perspective of what's normal to a user by their purchase pattern, right? So if they are purchasing very rapidly throughout, that's like normal to them. But if I don't spend any money for like past 20 days and then I start buying a lot of things on the last 10 days, that's not normal, right? So this is where you detect anomaly in your patterns, right? This is what I'm trying to capture, the number of transition, the amount, and then the average transacted amount. Okay, so when I was building it, and I start to feel there's a lot of challenges coming because I have never worked with streaming data before. And then the streaming data, like I mentioned, there's no proper ending or beginning, right? It just there, right? Like by the time I joined the team, the data is already streaming, right? It's not me that started the streaming. It's already streaming. So I don't know when someone started the streaming. And then some records may arrive late. And then the amount of data that's coming in is not predictable, right? So you never know when the data's coming. And then you need to process the data on the fly. I can't just say, oh, sorry, I'm gonna process everything at the end of the day, like, you know, 
11.59, then I'll do something. You can't do that because the customer wants to know whether the data is fraud or not right now, right? You get SMS alert for purchasing something that's out of ordinary. This is a system that you try to capture your patterns and try to alert you if you're doing something out of ordinary, right? So I was looking through and then, uh, of course, open source first, right? That's how we do. I found Apache Bean. I don't want to pay anything. I, Apache Bean is like, oh, okay. So one thing that I, I noticed is like if I want to try it locally, it should work. And then if I push it to streaming, it should work. I shouldn't change a lot of code, right? That's, that's our dream. If you write one code for streaming, one code for batch, uh, you have to maintain two code. Then you, do, you have to do OT and all that. So I don't want that. So this is one of the, uh, one of the projects that is open sourced. And it can work same for batch and streaming, which means you don't have to change your code. Your code will work fine if you, even if you put in, like, say, CSV files or like the flat files, it will work. And then if you just switch the data entry to like a Kafka or like PubSub or anything, it will just stream in nicely as well. That's why we we call it a bin. Like you're trying to beam it in. Ah, yeah. It's not the bin. So it's like bin stand for. And does anyone know what BIN stands for? Anyone? No. I thought it's BEANS, like you're trying to beam it, right, like with the lights. Actually, it stands for batch and stream. Like BA is batch, AN is from streaming. <laughs> yeah, we are bad at naming things, so I, I don't know. So I thought Apache BIN is like because it's a data pipeline thing, you're, you're beaming the data somewhere, but no, BIN stands for batch and streaming. Like BA is batch and then streaming is AN. Right, yeah, so something that, uh, you know, some, some things that you can actually learn from. And it, it's actually supposed to amplify or uh, simplify some of the large scale data processing, right? It's, so it works, the same code can work for batch and streaming, and it can actually scale up to like a number that it can fit. So you can actually define a number of worker, and then they will actually try to process parallelly at the back end. Right, so you don't have to write, let's say, uh, multi-processing code yourself. They will do it by themselves. So this is really good because I don't have to then think about, oh, what happened? There's like five workers. What happened? There's like two workers. Something like that. Right, I will show you some of the code here. So this is how it looks, right? With Python, you just install Apache Bean and then import it. You create a pipeline. And there's one thing unusual is you see the pipe is being used in this index. You will never see this kind of pipe in other Python languages. But it's really enough, there's like pipe, which is like the vertical bar before like group by. And the rest are pretty much the same, right? So you have a tuples, and then you just create a tuple with a list, and then you have like a group by key for you to group by the, the keys, which is the, the emoji. And then we have like the map functions from Python that you can use lambda function to do anything you want. In this case, I'm just, just going to join all the, uh, the remainders, like the second columns, and then I put it back. Right? And then I bring the result. So math function takes in any function that you define, right? whether it's built in or you define yourself. And then there's other things like uh, partition do, partition elements, and so on as well. Right? So it works in, in the back end for you to kind of like uh, multi-process, so you don't have to kind of define uh, processing code yourself. OK, so, so far, any question? All good? Right, nice then I, I, I can continue. So, so one of the suggestions that people did, right, like, like I mentioned before, what if we want to process the data? Right? I, I want to know what's my customer spend or like the count at 10 a.m., right? I can block it by time chunk, right? So I want to know within one hour, I block it. Within two hours, I block it. Within three hours, I block it. And Apache Beans actually provide a few ways for you to chunk by time. And who knows, by chunking time, there's a lot more implication to be like unravel with. The first thing is what we call a fixed window, right? So it just moves, right? Like eight, like say, this is like 10 minutes block. So nine to nine ten is 10 minutes block. Nine ten to nine twenty, 10 minutes block. That's what we would normally use, right? It, what we call is a sliding window. No, this is, this is more like an average, right? So what happened? Last time, no, what's happened at that time? So this is by time base, right? It's within a time block. So I can't, so from here, let's say if I'm here, like 9.55, I, 
I can't know what's my last 10 minutes because my information from last, uh, the, the information for average is like 9.50. It doesn't include the last five minutes, right? Because this is by time blocks. So some of the use case is like, you calculate the number of transition, it's more closer to our batch processing, right? So when you do it per day, I want to know count per day, like from uh, 000 to 1159. So this is time blocks, right? But for streaming, we need a little bit more, right? So they also provide this thing called sliding window. So sliding window is what I really need, basically, right? So I want to know what's my transition last 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, right? And this is where things start to get complicated because by sliding window, you need to define how much you want to overlap, right? If you overlap too much, you have to process a lot more and it might not necessary, right? So this gap, the five minutes one, it has to be coming from like your business and data and things like that. It's, it takes a lot more research to be done in that way to be able to define a good breakpoint. Okay? So how this is used is like you want to find what's my purchase last uh, 20 minutes. Right? So this is what you do. But there's another one. Right? There's so many, so many ways to define a time block. Right? So this one is actually used for like website. You define per session per lock-in. So if you locked in, right, for example, you locked in a user one, you locked in, and then you maybe like go to another tab, you come back, you go to you know, cook something, you come back, until you want to wash room, then you take five minutes, then uh, it, it breaks to another session. So, so this kind of thing, let, let, imagine you have to program it, right? You have to put a lot of email statements and like rules and things like that, but beans take care of it already. You just have to say, like call the functions, and then it will just, take it as a session window from your streaming data, which is amazing. Right, so in the end, uh, I use the sliding window method, but with a slightly offset, right? So every time the data comes in, I will chunk the data into like one hour time block because my break is 60 minutes, 30 minutes, and 15 minutes. So instead of uh, seeking every 15 minutes, I just take one shot of one hour, just half, half. Right, so I'm not doing three writes. I just do one write and I chalk it off myself at the logic, logic level. So this is how it works. And I have a one minute overlap of every single data that come in. That means every one minute, my script will activate, process it, and then it will give it to the machine learning to do some other things like detecting fraud or not. Right, so this is why when you purchase something, after like a minute, you receive uh, SMS and say you just spent five hundred dollar buying something. Yeah, this is how it works, right? So there's always some delay, right? The, the delay actually depends on the computational power, your business requirement, and uh, of course, among other things like you know how how you're transferring the data and like the the model inference time and all that. So this kind of solved two of my problems that I had, like no proper ending and beginning. The beans handle it because you had, all you have to do is like just point to the, uh, the data stream. Bing will figure out where to start. So you don't have to define the time. Of course, you, de you can de define it. Let's say I want to start from yesterday. But if you don't provide anything, it will go and find it for you. Right? So which is, which is good. I, I don't want to do a lot more things. So it do it for me. And then even if some records may be arriving late. So Beam have this thing called a time slicing windows. Right? So it, has, uh, it forgive up to like, Define time, let's say 15 minutes. So if the data, so let's say you say uh, group by key within that time. Uh, let me go back to the, right, so yeah. So imagine, right, you are here, 940, right? And the data is supposed to come in here, we're late, okay? It's not supposed to come in. And you execute your trigger, your trigger, the processing here. The bin will try to rectify it if it's coming from here. So if the data are here and your, your allowance is five minutes, even if the data arrive here, the bin will, bin will try to calculate it back inside. So it will wait until it's triggered, retrieve it, and then put it as one block. So they will do data rectifications and so on. And if you are into like creating your custom stuff, there are other things like timer class for you to like define when do you trigger. Uh, you can create your own custom, right? So it doesn't always have to be time-bound. So time-bound is default, right? Sometimes you, you want to like action-bound, 
right? So you want to activate the trigger as soon as you tap the card, not based on the time, something like that, right? Okay, so then I, I looked through and then I found this uh, data flow. So data flow is managed Apache Beam, right? So it's actually a fully managed, so you don't have to worry about how many uh, processes you have, whether there's a, a huge load of data coming in. It's also one-to-one uh, -one exchange with Apache Beam. So you don't have to write new code. You don't have to install anything else. It just works itself. I will just show you some of the code I have. So data flow demo, right? So you already seen this one already. So this is how the end product looks like. Let me just zoom in a little bit. So my first step is to read from the data stream, and then I have to decode the byte into JSON. After that, I get to attach the timestamp because I have my own defined timestamps because I don't want to use the built-in one, so I wrote it myself. Then I create a sliding window for the data chunks to be in. After I have a sliding window, I add the window info problem. Right? So every time I chunk the, the data into timestamps, I name the timestamps to a unique one so that I can then combine it back. Okay? So after that, I convert all this to name tuple so that it's easier to work with the group by statements. So I group by to the custom key, group by customer ID, composite key, and then I assign the key to each aggregator results. And from the right side, I'm only filtering uh, 30 minutes, one hour, and, uh, and so on, right? After that, I march the data back. So I export all the co uh, you know, timestamps, window, and then the filtering average and so on. I, I march it back. And then I filter all the empty ones that cannot find. Or sometimes user don't spend anything within the time frame. So you will have received you know, some of the empty. Then you have to reformat your custom data and then you have to print it up. Right. So this is how it all works. And I'm going to show you the code now. Okay. So the code itself is fairly straightforward. Uh, you install Apache Bean, right? And then uh, you just create a pipeline. So here I'm importing pipeline options combine and means, right? So even you put like group bytes and all these things, they already put custom functions, I mean, built-in function ready. So you don't have to write any sum or like summations and things like that. So you just like, just plug and play kind of thing, right? So yeah, I'm defining my windows, uh, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and 60 minutes, and then I'll convert it to seconds, and then my window period and so on. So this is all the auxiliary functions. Like I wrote it myself to like convert to Unix time, the th time zones, and like how do you print the element info, right? And then uh, how do you put additional data? So if I'm going to have like composite key of customer ID and the window, I create a composite key here, and then the time difference between the time sends and the window, right? So all these things. Then after I have all the information I have, I also want to reformat it in a way that I want it. So I reformat, like basically renaming all the columns, right? So I don't want to have like a lot of, uh, you know, uh, randomly generated, uh, randomly generated co column names in my, my output. So that's why I do it. So this is a dummy data that I created. It's kind of reflect on the data that we just uh, show you, right? You have uh, transition ID, timestamps, customer ID, terminal ID, and the amount, right? So although there's like five, six columns, if I actually run this, I have to just define this thing called pipeline options, right? And then I say check all the types because I want to make sure that I'm using the type uh, correctly. Then the runner is direct runner. So direct runner means you're running locally, okay? So if you want to run it on the cloud, you just have to change the runner and then the code will then run on the cloud. So we are here trying to do, uh, put the options that I defined inside. Then I create a pipeline, so I will define a source. So my source is the pipeline, and then, so the pipeline here is this pipeline, actually. So it's empty, right? So you define it as empty, and then every pipe is your modifications. So every step from this pipeline is actually immutable. So if you, you cannot change something, so like for example, you have pipeline, and then you use pipeline, the second step to change something, and then you use that pipeline to do another one, you can't do that. And you can only do flow down, right? So you, you can only flow. That's why beaming up to the flow. And you cannot, you cannot modify previous step from the, la, the, the following steps. So it's, all, it's one way. So everything go down one by one. Okay, so this is how I 
input my uh, data, the dummy data, inside the, the flow. Right? So we have five records initially. Now the, all the five records are becoming JSON uh, format, and then you print it out here. OK, so now we're going to enrich the data. So this is definitely not enough. I need more, more data. Right? So the good thing about Beam is that you can actually break. Right? So I'm going to break the source just by importing data, and then I enrich the source by putting source here. Right, so they will take the first as the input. Right, so think of it like a pipe. Try to try to stick all the pipe together. Right, so this source is the main pipe that I built on top, and then every source is like another pipe that I just slotted in to enrich all the data set. I do the uh, timestamp, sliding window, converting the link tuples, and then and so on. Right, so after that, it all becomes name tuple. Like you can see from here, initially it was JSON. Then then it started having this like you know, row IDs and like, so what it does is you, you now can able to do like row dot ID, then it will give you the ID. Instead of having the, the JSON and then I have to pass the JSON. Okay, so it's a lot of code, I mean a lot of output just from five because I'm doing it by timestamp window. Okay, so the next steps, right? Every steps, I break it into different uh, pipe. So whenever I want to change something, I just, I just replace the pipe. So I don't have to then rewrite any of the code from above. OK, so here I am do the uh, aggregation of customer ID. So I'm going to group by customer ID with the time window. It's uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and uh, 60 minutes. You can see from this uh, column name here. right? So I'm going to do number of transition 50 minutes, number of transition 30 minutes, and so on. If you look at the code, it's all lambda functions. Right? I don't write anything fancy. Like it's just lambda row. If it's less than this, I just do that. And then what I'm going to do is to group by. Right? So when I group by, and then I define uh, combined functions. So we go, we're going to do count combined functions, meaning you count how many records you appear within that time frame. The same thing for the next one is the mean combined functions. It, it will create an average of the transitions and then the number of amount that you have. Right? So. The same thing, it will print out a lot of records because we have a lot of timestamps and the processing every one minute. Right, so this is like the final one. Right? We have the source pipe, we have the enriched source where you enrich it, you have the aggregator customer ID, and then now we filter only the new elements and then assign key for new elements <coughs> and then so on. Right, so once we have the results already, we just print them out, right? Filter the empty row, uh, format the element back, then you print it out. So you, you get a very nicely formatted uh, row like this, right? And it, it looks like very complicated and like a lot of, you know, very hard to read, I would say. But when you're working in this, like this kind of uh, environment, you can really f detect some of the, the things that is making you like, you know, can't sleep for nights. So yeah, this is, the whole code actually, but now what I'm going to show you is to deploy this to Google Cloud, right? So if I want to deploy something, something I need to create into like, you know, um, containerizations or like I need to change the code here, but this one, I just need to change one thing, right? So of course I define our, our credential here and then define some of the uh, subscription names to read it from the cloud and so on. So this code is just to read the data from the cloud, right? Just to show that the data are coming in. But all I have to do is take this, this one, right? If I'm taking in streaming data instead of the flat data, right? So just now we were doing it from the list, right? It's an it's a initialized variable. If I want to make it streaming, I just say streaming equal true, right? I command the code because if it's streaming, it cannot run uh, forever on my, my laptop. I have to like, you know, close it. It will cause error and so on. So if you want to like stream from your laptop, you can do that, right? Given that your laptop can handle the workload and so on, right? So don't do it for your startup, okay? If your laptop die, your startup die. Uh, yeah, so the codes are all the same, right? Just that you need to change these uh, streaming options. The only two things that you change is runner and streaming. So if the streaming true, it taking the streaming data, it will do all the chunkings and it will do all the uh, finding the, the source and finding the start point and so on. Right? Just by having a flag here, it will handle it for you. And this is the, the final code for putting on the cloud. Right? So let me just show you what's the difference. So the, the only difference is here. here. 
right, I'm putting runner as data flow runner, which will run on data flow. Streaming is already true. And then, of course, I need to define where's, you know, where do I want to put my uh, cloud project in, what kind of requirement, and what's the number of workers that I want. Right? So let's say you don't want to go up until like hundreds of thousands of workers. Right? Maybe you just want to keep your cost low or control. You can actually define. In this case, I'm defining the two because I don't want to spend a lot of money doing this. So I define the two, and then if you want, let's say, I, I, need, I need more power. I want the process to go faster. You can change it to like six or 10, up to you, right? So of course, more workers come with more money. The only problem is if there's a lot of, like, let's say, you, you get spam, right? Like a lot of people come in, then your costs go up. So this is where you need to kind of like have a guard together to kind of prevent people from abusing your systems. But the, the good thing is, if there's no one using it, it goes down to one. Right? So even if you, know, you put like 10 here, there's no system that using, there's no work to do, it will scale it down to one. It only charge you for one. Right? So I just run this, and then it will just appear like this here on the cloud. Right? So that's the, that's the whole demo, actually. I will take any question if you have. We have, like, I think, four more minutes, or three more minutes. Actually, it's, um, oh, you're on time, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, a big, because this, this section is the last section, so I can uh, give you more time to, like, ask some question to, to you as well. And do you have, like, uh, any question about, like, the data flow and to, uh, to use the Apache beam on data flows? Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yep. Is, is there like a maximum number of bytes per second that, that it can handle, or is it just dependent on the number of workers that you define? Yeah, so for the processing itself, it's dependent on the number of workers that you provide, but it also depends on the streaming uh, service, right? So the streaming service is not part of the flow. It could be coming from another streaming, let's say uh, Apache Kafka, one of the uh, popular one. And uh, in Google Cloud, we use PubSub. So if the streaming can only produce maybe 100 messages per second, even if you put 10 workers there, they're not going to do more than what is necessary. But if the streaming is a lot, right? let's say you're going to input uh, 100,000 records and then the bottleneck will become the number of workers. So if the number of workers only 10, they can only do 10 jobs at one time. And, and then you, how do you know that the number of workers is not enough to process all yeah. of the incoming so data? Yeah, so let me show you some of the graph. So like from here, you can kind of examine like the number of throughput here. Like you can see, so data freshness is like how updated your system is based on what's coming in. Right, so you usually want your data freshness to be like really high, right? And then uh, let me see, is there any more charts that I can show you? Data freshness. And then you can see like uh, if your current worker is like, currently is one, even though I set max worker two, right? But it's, it's still one. If, you're, if, you're, if you set 10 and then like it's all used out 10 all the time, this is where you think, okay, maybe I need to increase to 12 and see whether that actually helps. So data freshness is one of the indicators. If your data is not fresh enough, that means your workers are behind. Right? And then you come here and look and say, okay, how does the auto-scaling work? As, has they all maxed out? If they are all maxed out, like you, you define 10, all 10s are working, and then data freshness is not, not fresh, this is where you increase the workload. But the good thing is, even if you put 20, and then they only need 12, they will only use 12. Any, any more questions? Do you have any best practice or maybe suggestion on calculating the pricing? Because mm. for the data flow, when it's pricing, it has the data processing unit yep. in the pricing. Maybe can you tell us more about how to calculate that? Because I try to estimate that, and, and it's like it's very hard for the DPU data processing unit. Yeah. So. There is a GCP calculator. Yes. I'm not sure that will I mean, help. How, how, how to come up with the ah, unit? Yeah. So 
I think there's internal, uh, so for me, there's internal functions that I can call. It's the same for like LMM stuff, right? You need to count the tokens to, to know how much you are charging. So in this case, there's like Bay Explainer, for example, that can actually use to see the cost here. And you can see how much the cost is going up, going down, and then how to estimate, right? But to be able to do like very minute calculation of like what's the, how, I mean, how many, Pentabyte of data I'm processing, and then how much I get charged per pentabyte. Is is really need to like talk to the sales rep and like get it break down. Yeah, because what happened is when you use this process, like the job, the the backends is like like uh, VMs or like when you spin out a VM, they kind of take that VM cost as well. And then if you are let's say streaming from like another web services or like any of the uh, cloud, there's also a ingress costs that are coming in, right? Because you are taking data from there, there have to be temporary storage to receive the data, basically. So those costs are the ones that you need to figure out. Like, so one thing, figure out what other additional services that they are using to like, do some activities, like streaming in, scaling up, scaling down. Right? Do I get charged for those? And then you have to, like, not just like, data flow, right? you have to do that. And then, uh, yeah, so this is where you see the estimate cost, and you start seeing like big numbers, stop it, and then start calling your sales rep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, you have said that uh, we can do, uh, we can set the maximum worker number, yep. but when the uh, steaming data is not uh, exceed to that maximum number, yep. the Apache Bing can optimize without using the maximum number. Okay, yep. and then the data uh, reach to the maximum number. Mm -hmm. Now our streaming flow will be uh, slow, right? Yep. And then uh, can this Apache Bean can recommend how much, uh, how, how many this uh, maximum worker should mm. we increase, something like that? Uh, give there a is a recommendation. So if you, if you look at this, there's a recommendations. So if this happens, like the, the questions for the gentleman you asked as well, if this happened to have like the data choking, there's an insight that come out from here. Like you should increase your worker to three or four, right? But this is just insight. You know your data best, right? So when you increase it, and of course it only use what you, uh, what you are supposed to use. And then you can see from these matrices as well, right? Like number of CPU you are using per, per worker, right? And the number of like CPU time plus the memory. So sometimes it's not the number of workers, it's the, the CPU for the worker that you have. Right? So like it's not you don't have a lot of people, it's just that the people have to work harder. Is that make sense? Yeah, so so you have to like see the inside. So you can't just increase a number of worker because the work is slow. It could be that they need to get upgraded to the next tier. So you also think from that angle as well. Okay? Thank you very Thank much. You. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, you can you can ask it. It's okay. No, I have a question as well. Oh, the cost, yeah. yeah, the cost. Yeah, I think the best way is to like talk to the sales rep because they. So what I heard is they have like specific ways to kind of like cut down. So they have like best practices for you to do. There's some checklist that you have to do to follow to like really keep the cost low and things like that. So they will be the best person to know, right? Because this is just a tool. And then how you use the tool, like for example, you are streaming data from like PubSaw or like Apache Flink or some other tools, it might have different costs associated with it, right? Because how fast you're moving and like what, what type of data, there's like conversion do we need to do, things like that. So there's a lot more things come into play when you're calculating like overall cost, for example. 